The information provided on Dr. Tom Rosell Live by Dr. Tom Rosell DC, interview guests, show co-hosts, or substitute hosts is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. It is for general information purposes only. Information from this broadcast should not replace the appropriate consultation and examination process by a licensed physician. Always consult your own physician prior to changing any current medical directive or prescription. Dr. Tom Rosell Live, right now on 105.9 FM and AM 630 WMAL. Welcome to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. This is Dr. Tom Rosell. I'm live in studio. It's hot outside. It's cooler inside here. Give me a call, 888-630-9625, 888-630-9625. Yeah, let's kind of watch the uh, the weather today, guys. You know, it's one of those days that you want to be very, very hydrated, Lots and lots and lots of water, because if you don't, you're going to feel miserable. Not only just tired, but you can do some damage. So get that bottle of water and keep sipping. Every few minutes, have a little bit of water, particularly if you're outside. But you know what? Even when you're inside, that heat still can get to you. So make sure that you're doing a good job of it. And you might want to add just a little bit of sea salt. Not regular salt, but sea salt. And it'll hold that in. Coconut water as well is really good to keep your body very hydrated. But get it done because I don't want to hear anything happens to you that's a bad thing. 888-630-9625. Those of you who came to the the office uh, last Thursday evening heard a very special lecture on sleep apnea. Dr. Michael Chung and yours truly presented a kind of very kind of complex back and forth uh, presentation on what happens when you start snoring and you lose uh, the ability to breathe. That's called sleep apnea. And that particular type is called obstructive. And we went over another one that's called central. That's when you just stop breathing. You know, everything seems to be working, but nothing's happening. And it happens, unfortunately, to a lot of people. The most, it's it's the, the one that's uh, the oddball out, but nevertheless, and you can have both of them. But we talked about that. We talked about what happened to children and SIDS and so forth. We're going to talk a little bit about the brain today because I connected it all to the area of the brain called the reptilian brain or the old brain, the one that's automatic brain. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well today, but in an area that uh, may you may not have thought about. And what we're going to talk about is what happens between the the brain and your intestinal tract. And I'm going to take it in a different direction because I've been asked that question so many times and I'm surprised that after listening to me all the times that you've all listened to me that you really haven't made the connection. So is there a connection between trauma, injury, and the intestinal tract? If you hit your head, if you irritate your nervous system, can your intestinal tract go wacky? and not work the way it's supposed to. So I'm going to give you the short answer first, and then we're going to talk about why. The answer is absolutely, positively, unequivocally, yes, it can. So any injury over time, whether it's subtle or it's very significant, impactful, can cause problems in the GI tract. We've touched upon topics like vagal vasal reflex, you know, with that vagus nerve, that 10th cranial nerve that we call the wanderer because it's such a long, long nerve. It starts in the brain, goes all the way down and touches everything, including the gut. Well, we're going to talk about that little culprit today, and I'm going to try to put it together for you. But remember, that gut-brain connection or the brain-gut connection is vital importance, and it's primary in the evaluation of so many things that goes on in the body. We have to understand that that intestinal tract is your second brain, so to speak. Why? Because it feedback loop that occurs constantly, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's a huge evidence, uh, a body of evidence, if you will, let's put it that way, to support the role between an intestinal system that is working and one that's not working when it comes to the brain and how that functions, but also the brain, if it's not working properly, your intestinal tract, your microbiome, all those little bacterial pieces that you have in your gut can't can't even begin to get off on the right foot and do what they're supposed to be doing. The good bacteria, the microbiota within the intestinal tract, you know, should be considered another organ system. And as far as I'm concerned, there's this feedback loop that occurs there. It has to be taken in consideration. We run off and we take acidophilus and we take bacillus and we take all of these different probiotics. The problem is, is that if the intestinal system's not working, you can take all the probiotic and the prebiotic and put everything in your intestinal tract, 
but it doesn't matter because that electrical spark isn't there. I'm going to talk about exactly how that comes about. I think you need to know, but in the meantime, call me because we're going to connect these to a lot of things you're doing. And some of these medications, matter of fact, a lot of the medications, what I dare say most of your medications that you're taking, is going to affect either the intestinal tract or the brain one way or the other. And so subsequently, they're going to affect each other. So, you know, let's kind of take this lid off, if you will. Let's go to our relay station. Let's talk about the brain. That brain is like your computer. It's your, your mainframe. And if I decapitated you, guess what happens? We all know what happens, right? You're not here anymore. You're dead. You're, you're, you're not functioning. But it can be injured so like a computer, it's not uh, sending signals to all the attachments. And those things can't work unless the uh, electrical impulse, the software is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, you know, we think of our stuff, you know, when we think of our stomachs, you know, when we're hungry, right? If, I got to go feed, feed myself. I got to put something. And then when our mood is affected, we'll say, well, you know, it's my gut. Or we say, I have my instincts. My gut tells me. You know where that expression came from? And the fact that the, the gut is a second brain and it has instinctual reflexive patterns, phenomena that are consistent with that statement. And if you go through and you start reading the literature and, and uh, all the uh, the guys that are out there that have anything to do with stress and anxiousness, uh, you know, portrayals of how we how these things happen, you're going to find that those statements are absolutely true. You know, we eat to feel better. It gives us that feel good, you know, satiated, you know, I I need to I need to eat type of thing, and it comes from a lot of different reasons, not just our environment, but of our gut. The idea that um, there's a complex and scientific coexistence or bond, if you will, not even a coexistence between the intestinal tract, we'll call it the gut, and the brain is very well documented. It's not a far-fetched idea. It's very straight up. Let's go back to what we were talking about with the vagus nerve a couple of weeks ago, and I said to you that it is 80% a sensory nerve. It's a regulatory nerve. It tells the brain what's going on, but it also has direct impact and action on other areas, including the intestinal tract. So, what and you know, if you listen to the program, we said that the intestinal system produces approximately 80% of all the neural transmitters, neurological transmitters. These are guys that initiate communication from one cell of the nervous system to another. So it's important that we understand that there is a linkage there. There's something that we have to put our fingers on. We're going to talk about what happens when you get an injury. We're going to talk about inflammatory pathways and so forth. But when you analyze the stomach and the mind connection, there's a real, it, it grabs you and says, why didn't I think of that? I mean, it's there. Researchers looked at, at all kinds of stool samples, you know, your waste material, right? And did brain scans, and they did intensive studies and information uh, gathering on these participants that, you know, went through these studies. And they looked at behavior. They looked at physiology. They looked at outcomes. And the results provided was an insight into how early incidences, trauma, can provide, uh, can uh, end up with long-term physical effects. These researchers, these guys found that students with irritable bowel syndrome, and they did a study, students are always the guinea pigs. They, you know, they go out to university and say, hey, you, know, what, you want to get, make a couple bucks? So they found that students with irritable bowel syndrome had greater levels of anxiety and depression than any of the control groups that they had, You know, guys that they set aside and they just watch, right? Interestingly, Researchers found that some of the students with IBS did not have distinct bacteria, microbiome, uh, from, that were different than the control students. Some uh, had very distinguishing features that were, were, that were different. Students with IBS also had considerably different types of flora. They had a greater history of injury experiences in their childhood, going all the way back to the time they were kids, getting punched in the stomach, falling off a, a slide, hitting their head, bumping, kids stuff, you know, all the things that we do. And what they noticed was an intensification of the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome when these things existed historically. And then they, you know, they 
extrapolated this to teenagers and adults and people who had never had a problem until they had, what, an injury. So trauma can result in a lot of precarious situations. It can be, you know, a direct impact. It can be something that is noxious or irritating to the system. And then what they did is they found that this trauma, this injury to the second brain, the intestinal tract, in fact, then set the stage, predisposed the person, the being, to other things down line. And they started connecting it to pain patterns that would never go away. Chronic, fibromyalgia-like, myofasciitis uh, type of pain. They started relating it to things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and the potentiation of things like MS and the inability to function and focus. They saw people who not had brain trauma but had intestinal tract injury and trauma ultimately did very poorly in school compared to the controls. So we start looking at something and say, oh, my God. And then the feedback loop was so significant that now the brain trying to modify and modulate began to set the stage for, you know, uh, a very distinct, I've got a brain problem when the problem didn't start in the brain itself. So we're going to talk about that. It's an, it's an important relationship that we've been dealing with and have noticed clinically for all the years that I've been in practice. And it's important that we get that those two pieces are connected, that if you have a head injury, a trauma, that it can cause intestinal dysfunction. And if you have intestinal dysfunction, you can have minor injuries in your body that now become major and never go away. And so we're going we're gonna to get into this thing, this, this brain-gut axis and the chronic inflammatory reaction that, that uh, occurs. So the GI system, the gastrointestinal system, often gets irritated, gets inflamed. And by the way, we can have indirect trauma to the gut. What does that mean? That means that, you know, the stuff you put in your mouth that you shouldn't be putting in there, things you eat you shouldn't, things you need more of, you don't give yourself the opportunity to eat enough of. You know, the incoming stuff that's going to irritate that track. All our foods, particularly in Western culture, in this country, are so majorly modified that body can't function. You know, in Europe, GMO products are not legal. They are here. So you're the guinea pigs, by the way, just saying that you are. And so your gastrointestinal inflammation that exists because of injury, irritation, inflammation, remember acid, you've heard me talk about it before, inflammation, think acid. Uh, this is a common sequela to traumatic brain injury and injury to the intestinal tract ultimately produces ongoing neurological deficit and pain that can't be found as far as where's the triggering mechanism. So given the intimate connection between the brain and the gut, it really makes a strong clinical uh, sense to look at all these pieces. And particularly when a patient has had injury to the gut, they've fallen, they've hit themselves. And patients who have had uh, injuries to the neck and the shoulder and the head and now in a chronic pain situation. We've seen these things repetitively time in and time over again and we're going to try to make that connection for you. It's a very important connection. We're here at 888 That's 888 Give me a call on this weekend just before Independence Day. Don't go away. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosal Live. I'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Tom Rosell. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosell live. I'm in studio, 888-630-9625. That's 888-630-9625. Love to talk to you. It is the weekend before Independence Day coming up this Wednesday. That's kind of the middle of the summer already. What's going on here? I mean, it's kind of just slipped by. So make sure you get out and have some fun. It's a beautiful day today, but a little warm outside, so be careful. Take it easy. Make sure you're well hydrated. Put a little sea salt you know, in there so that water stays there. By the way, the indications of dehydration, you're going to feel first very fatigued. You're going to get grumpy. Your muscles are going to hurt. You're not going to be able to think. And if you get too dehydrated, and you know, by the way, headache goes with that, you may just drop and pass out. Not a good thing. Not good, not good at all. So please, please, please stay hydrated. I know a lot of you think that water is for washing, but it's also for consuming. And, you know, all the other drinks that you have, you know, the teas and the coffee, that's not water. It actually dehydrates you even 
more. So make sure that you're very well predisposed, if you will, to water in your body. Indeed. We're talking about gut dysfunction and things that uh, it... The gut dysfunction is caused by, and one specifically, traumatic brain injury, and how uh, traumatic injury of the gut also causes brain dysfunction, pain, and so forth. There's a connection. That's why they call the gut the second brain. Gut-brain connection is something that, for all doctors, we have to be extremely aware of and be able to dot the I's and cross the T's and really do the job. We're going to talk a little bit about that gut-brain axis, uh, and specifically when it comes to injury, we're going to talk about the uh, some of the dietary patterns that you really need to avoid if you want it to heal. And we're going to talk about what happens with uh, neurodegeneration and chronic pain and the like. So stay tuned to us the rest of the program. You have somebody that is uh, suffering that way, tell them to you know, tune us in real quick right now before the program you know comes to its conclusion about 30 minutes from now. But let's go to the phones. Charmaine, how can I help you? Hi, doctor. This is off the topic. I hope you don't mind. But it, it, off, off topic is a very good thing. <laughs> go ahead. I'm in pain. I left a culture uh, to see if I have a UTI on Friday, and they gave me peridium, and it's not doing a thing for me. I am burning, and I, I can't sleep. I mean, it's awful. Is there something else I could be doing other than peridium? Uh, yeah, that, they're just trying to block the pain cycle. But let's uh, let's talk about what really happened. How first? How long has this been going on with you? Well, I got a UTI on May third, believe it or not, and I have been on amoxicillin, Bactrim, Macrobid, and finally and, Cipro. And nothing's worked, right? Okay, so let me tell you what's going on. It's not a bacterial infection. So if it's you had, had no, if you had a bacterial infection, you've taken enough. Uh, strong anti antimicrobials to knock down a horse. And a lot of them have very interesting side effects like pain throughout your whole body. Uh, the, the, the ciproflaxin or the cipro that you're taking can you give you joint pain and muscle pain like nobody's business. So, but the fact is, is this, if it was uh, bacteria with all the things you just listed, you would have been much better. Maybe not completely resolved if you had a co-infection, but the fact that it didn't work at all tells me it's not that. So here's the deal. I'm going to give you a couple things to do, and it's probably going, it's, first of all, it's not going to hurt you in any way, and it can help. So you're going to go to the store, and you're going to, you're going to buy uh, a, a, a tea that I'm going to tell you about in just a second. And you're going to drink about four or five cups of that a day. You're going to make it really very strong. And you might even douche with it. So to make sure that you prepare the gut. So you're going to, you're also going to get a non-dairy, uh, probiotic. And you can get them at mom's or, uh, Whole Foods and so forth. They've all got it, but it has to be non-dairy. Okay. Is Culturel one of those? I'm sorry. I've been, taking, I've been taking Culturel. Is that a non-dairy? Uh, it's yes. It's, I think you're you're going to be pretty good with that. But it's okay. but it's that's just the beginning stages. Uh, Pauli Arco. It's also called Tahibo. It's also called Pau. I'm not, I'm not understanding. I know. Okay, so you're going to uh, write me a note after the program. But it's Pau P A U. P A U. Right, and then a space, and then the letter D, with D. a hot right, and then a space. Arco, A-R-C-O, Pau D. A-R-C-O. Okay, Pau D. Arco. It's the bark of a tree in South America, and you want to make sure that it is from South America. And you're going to uh, ask them how to do it, but you're going to make a very strong tea out of it, and I want you to drink about four cups of that a day. And then... Four cups a day. Okay. And, you know, I won't take the time, but I know you're suffering, and I want you to, you know, to follow this through. The other thing that I want you to do is to avoid anything that has sugar in it or dairy in it or peanuts or peanut butter or alcohol. Nothing. I mean, it has to be 100%. Okay. Okay. And then start start with that. Now, I don't know the rest of your body, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to give you other directions because some of even the natural herbal preparations can have a little bit of a side effect. So start with that. Follow it directly. You can douche as well. Make a, uh, make a cup of tea, bring it down to room temperature, and you can use that as a retention douche. If you have any questions, send me a note. 
and I'm more than happy to be much more specific with you. But do that. It can't hurt you, and it can only help you until you can find out what this is all about. I'm sorry that you're suffering so badly, my friend. It's one of those things that when you take antibiotics and they don't work, it's not bacterial. There's other things that are there as well. Be right back. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. Dr. Tom Rosell Live continues now on 105.9 FM and AM 630 WMAL. Welcome back. This is Dr. Tom Rosell. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. Yes, you are. 888-630-9625. That's how you find me here. And when we're not here. Go to rosellecare.com. That's R-O-S-E-L-L-E-C-A-R-E.com. Check out the site. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Have all kinds of things for you to watch and information on upcoming classes that most of our patients find extremely, extremely interesting. As I said last Thursday night, those of you who missed it, missed a really lovely evening with Dr. Michael Chung and yours truly, and we presented a night on sleep apnea, what happens, why, the, the, the causative patterns and so forth. And it's a, it's a problem that, you know, you can get rid of your uh, your CPAP, and there's some very interesting dental appliances, but more importantly, wouldn't it be fun, wouldn't it be good to find out why you stop breathing in the first place? I mean, just suddenly don't breathe, and some of you do that when you're not snoring. I told a, a story about uh, a situation that I get myself into when I've gone diving, and it's called mask crush. And when you're a diver and you have a mask on, it's like an, another set of sinuses. So it's another set of bells, a, a buoyance regulator. And over the years, I've learned to really be calm underwater and I slow my breathing down. And so when I get in, I forget sometimes that I'm underwater and I got to breathe and because I'm so calm and I love being underwater. So what's happened is when you don't do that and the pressure builds up as you get lower because you have to equalize the pressure from the outside to the inside, the mask crushes your face and you end up with all these broken vessels and you look like somebody beat you in a bar fight. And that's happened. So this is essentially what can happen as well when you have a loss of uh, oxygenation that's due to what we call a central sleep apnea, which is the not the most common type, by the way. It's the rarest form. And you can cause damage. Now, where that comes from in many cases is a disturbance in an area of the brain that we're talking about right now in the vestibular portion of the brain. And it's uh, that rudimentary brain that causes automatic control of breathing and heartbeat and uh, regulation of so many organ systems can be affected if there is injury to the face or the head, then it can affect the gut. Remember we talked about the vagus nerve, that wander, that long nerve that goes into the intestinal tract. That nerve can cause all kinds of problems. It's feedback. It tells the brain what to do. But here's the flip side of that. Here's the flip side of that. Because it attaches everything when you have other damage to organ systems. And in this case, we're talking about the intestinal tract. You get hit in the stomach, you fall down, or you injure it simply because you're putting the wrong stuff in there. Because that gut is the second brain, it can feed back into the nervous system, now causing dysregulation to the brain and to the neuromuscular system. And now you end up with pain that will not go away. You end up with high levels of inflammation called acid. Remember what we said, inflammation, acid. We see depletions of things like your omega fatty acids, your neurotransmitters that the intestinal tract makes 80% of it no longer are, are there. So you've got this ongoing process, this ongoing back and forth thing, but it can start from injury to the gut. So impact sustained during any contact form you know you get, sport you get a, a a soccer player that you know falls on his stomach or her stomach you get hit in the gut you get stick you get in a you're fighting you know with whoever you take a shot to the gut well you only took a shot to the gut well you know a lot of the fighters in the ring even though that they didn't take maybe perhaps a lot of shots to the head they took a lot of shots to the intestinal tract you know, going back, as my son would say, when the dinosaurs ruled the, the earth and guys that I remember, like Rocky Marciano, you know, he used to take tons of, of body hits just so he could take one shot. And but he ended up with problems. And there's a lot of uh, martial, martial artists as well that have 
ended up with brain injury and body pain simply because it was their intestinal tract that was injured. Now they have real problems and their neurospinal system. So when you look at these things, it's a multifactorial condition and has ramifications throughout the entire body, but at the brain itself, and it's not looked at properly. So immediately following any kind of injury, you know, there's there may be experiences such as, you know, a headache or body pain throughout and lethargy. I don't feel good. Your mood changes. Anxiety levels go, you know, through the ceiling. And but you say, I didn't hit my head. What happened? And patients will notoriously come in when they're in pain and say, but I didn't hurt myself. Well, yes, you did. And then, you know, we start pulling that out and it's a really uh, intimate connection between that intestinal tract and the brain and the brain and the intestinal tract. Let's go to the phones. Diane, how can I help you? Thank you for being uh, patient. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I actually have two questions. One, at the end of March, I was pushed, fell, and got a C2 cervical fracture. Oh, that's not good. And all, after that, all of a sudden, I did have uh, what I think is it was diagnosed as reflux. Yes. Um, so do you want me to tell you why? I to take antacids. Um, so any kind of a sure. help for me there? Yeah, absolutely. So you need to see you know people who know what they're doing when it comes to that area. This was uh, we talked about this actually the other night because the same area that you're talking about and causing the reflux can have a problem on breathing patterns as well. There's a nerve that comes out from C2 and just underneath it C3. Together they make up a nerve called the phrenic nerve, and it's one of three neurological inputs to the diaphragm, this big muscle that cuts you in half. And if the diaphragm doesn't move properly, then the you can't breathe as well, but you're also going to put more pressure on the stomach, and you're going to squeeze that stomach, and it's going to produce acid, and it's going to back up. Now, the other piece is from that outside that second cervical vertebrae, because if you've got trauma there, you've, you've distorted a lot of the structural pieces. The vagus nerve, our big wanderer, goes all the way down and touches the diaphragm and touches the stomach, and it can be hyperactive. So it has to be settled down. You're getting now what's called a vasal vagal pattern, and there's a lot of different ways of approaching that and handling that. But that's what happened, That and you know, you're very lucky that you ended up and uh, with that's that's all because if you fracture this little bump in there, it's called the odontoid process at that second cervical. Uh, I'm glad you're breathing and you're still here with us. Yeah, well, let me ask you that. Uh, unfortunately, I have not been healing because uh, my husband, who was supposed to help me with chores and so forth, didn't do it. I did all kinds of activities that I should not be doing. Do you have any suggestions? Um, it's now been since the end of March, and my neurosurgeon said there's been no evidence of healing. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, there's a lot that can be done. I, I haven't seen your x-rays, so I'd have to look at them, but I'd also have to know more about you. Do this. Go to my website. Go to rosellecare.com. Send me a note. Remind me of our conversation, and I will tell you the steps that you have to take to have that figured out. You're, out of, you're in Culpeper, correctly? Yeah. I really don't want to have a fusion. No, and if you shouldn't, uh, you know, a lot of things they do, they put a halo cast on you to try to see if it'll heal. Uh, but I need to know more about it, and we don't have the time on the program. There's, it's, of course. It's a course of conversation. I might even call you. Uh, but do that for me. This I would is, love to do that. And, and I know I don't want to take up a lot of your time, but my husband fell like three times <laughs> and hit his head on a hard surface. And he too is can't figure out why he feels so awful. He has no, he has he's feeling nauseated from time to yeah. time, and very common. Doesn't have energy, so it's the same situation. You think? It, well, there's so many connections in that, but that still comes from that lower portion of the brainstem, and it's there's areas that are called the medulla, the pons, the reticular formation. I'm just giving you words, but that's the uh, that's the lower portion of the brain. And it has uh, complete control of all those things that you and I are talking about right now. Yeah. And you know, you ha if there's structural misalignment, the the alignment has to be brought back into normalcy. 
if um, there's injury to the cranial plates, the, the skull bones, there's 22 of them. And, they, yeah. and when you hit them or you hurt them or you put pressure on them, they lock sometimes so they don't move the spinal fluid the way they're supposed to. So there's techniques of being able to, uh, to get those to move properly. So you have to check a lot of different things. And it's, uh, it's, not, it's a step-by-step. -step, it's not complicated, but it has to be done accurately. There's just a lot of things to look at. And it can end up with all the things that you're talking about particularly the effects on the, the structural system, but then it's going to affect the gut, it's going to affect breathing, it's going to affect uh, even your your mood. It's, uh, can oh, be yes, I, absolutely, yeah. So uh, send me a note. And, on on and, him too, right? And, and I will give, yes, just go to rosalcare.com. And you know you can get in there. You can send it directly. It's a secure website. I'm the only one that's going to see it. And then I will get back to you within the next couple of days and give you you know some guidance as far as who you need to see. Okay? Oh, bless you. Um, you I'm so happy that I listened to your program. Today. I am glad Thank that you listened to. Thank you for too. what you do for all of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. Triple eight six three zero nine six two five. That's triple eight six three zero ninety six twenty five. You know, there's so many things that happen like that, and we don't get it. We don't understand the connecting points. And unfortunately, when you have those kind of traumas, here's a, a lady who broke her neck, broke the second cervical vertebrae. And not to scare her, as I said earlier, I'm glad that she is breathing and talking to me online because when you break a little piece of that second cervical called the odontoid, that's often called a hangman's fracture. And that's the one that they snap when they want to terminate you. Uh, so... God bless her, she's still here, and but there's more. If she's not healing, there's more that needs to be done, and we're going to try to direct her at least step-by-step, step, get her some connections that she can at least be evaluated with. This brain-gut pattern, you know, she talked about, you know, now she's got uh, GERD, she's got gastroesophageal reflux. Well, that's consistent with the nerves that come from that part of the body that go to the intestinal system and to the diaphragm and to the stomach. That's your communication. They don't work by themselves. They have to have this ongoing signaling. And if the signaling isn't correct, then you're going to end up with all of these musculoskeletal and, you know, you're going to get dampening of the types of things that they need to produce. Uh, it's important that we understand that we just can't blunt the symptoms. When you start blunting symptoms, you're setting up a lifetime, a lifetime of neurodegenerative conditions. There was an interesting article excuse me, that was published back in 2009. It, uh, it was in the Journal of Neural Trauma, Neurological Injury. And uh, the author was a guy by the name of Bansal, B-A-N-S-A-L, and his group. And what they did is they, they had this study, and they put it into a very, very specific conclusion. They said that there's a pathological or pathogenic wave, uh, a fluctuation, a signaling that flows from the brain to the gut. Okay, uh, and not patho pathological, wrong term, pathogenic, means it causes things to happen. But following a head injury, the brain, because of this back and forth wave, can become inflamed. So if you hurt the gut, you're going to hurt the brain. If you hurt the brain, you're going to hurt the intestinal tract. What's not obvious is the fact that this leads ultimately to inflammation within the intestinal tract that doesn't seem to go away, and then you get into the irritable bowel, you get into the IB, you get all these things that uh, that you start taking medications for because traditional, you know, well-meaning docs aren't. They don't know the connection. They don't get it. But we're, start, we're starting to see the things that I've observed in 41 years of practice coming out in an area called functional neurology today, knowing that this has such a huge impact. But the inflammation in the gut increases the what we call permeability in the intestinal tract because of injury directly to it and to the brain, to the gut, you know, which allows for large depletions in your immune system. You can't absorb your proteins. You can't break down the bacterial toxins. You can't protect yourself from certain things. Your allergy reactions go through the ceiling. You know, so you end up with this systemic, this throughout your whole body inflammation. And then pretty soon, this blood-brain barrier that you've all heard about, it's a protective veil, if you will. That's the best way I can put it to you. It's a protective veil that opens and fuels this inflammation. So now you've got these holes, just like a sieve. And it's just kind of going through. There's no barrier. The barrier doesn't work 
as well anymore. It's a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Kazarian uh, Datis, and one of the smartest guys that I've had the pleasure of meeting over the years. Uh, when I was going through some information and, and preparing for what I was going to talk to you about today, I came up, uh, across a, an article that he wrote some years ago, uh, Alternative uh, Therapeutic Health and Medicine Journal 2015, and he would talk to us specifically about what happens with his blood-brain barrier when it is uh, exposed to injury and how this otherwise protective shield, if you will, now causes the brain to break down. If you look up uh, Dr. Kazarian, he's got an alphabet soup around, uh, over his name that takes about three lines to, you know, to put together. He's, he's an incredible guy. But a compromised brain, blood-brain barrier allows the entry of all of these crazy bacteriums and microorganisms that you have in the, uh, that you have in your body and it causes the nervous system to begin to deteriorate and break down and it causes spinal systems to become tense you start seeing lack of function and mobility in, uh, in joint spaces but particularly in the spine in a sense both the brain and the gut are on fire they're hot they're they're inflamed they're they're acidic so the intestinal lining, by the way, what's called the mucosa, okay, because that's what it is, the intestinal mucosa can be very disordered. It no longer is the what it is following any kind of trauma. So when you have trauma, whether it's to the brain or to the body or the, particularly the gut, you have a traumatic in the brain, it's called traumatic brain in injury, TBI, and we know all the sequelae of that, and it's just nothing to mess with. You've got to get it checked out. But the same thing with the gut, with the intestinal tract. This, we're going to call it the second brain traumatic injury. And uh, all these guys have been studying this, and they're finally getting some of this stuff published. It's not that it's been unknown. It's that that traditional medical scientific community has poo-pooed it for such a long period of time. It hasn't become accepted, hasn't become public. You know, so when the intestinal tract, uh, the barrier, this lining is broken down, then you get toxins uh, that get in there. There's things called lipo, uh, lipopolysaccharides uh, and they ha other kinds of toxins that get into the system and they cause that body to break down and lectin levels, you know, get altered and things, uh, the uh, glutens that come from wheat and beans and so forth, they're allowed to cross that blood barrier and now you get sick and you can't get rid of the sickness and you hurt all over. And, you, and this comes from either uh, often just injury to the brain or injury to the gut and then they feed on each other. So when we look at something, when our office takes a look at you when you come in, we're looking at things multidimensionally. You can't look at it just, oh, here's the discomfort. You've got to ask the question, what happened? What was the injury? And paper comes in with bad gut. Did you ever? And I ask questions like, did you ever get hurt before? And they look at it like, I got four or five heads. Well, not so much. We're going to come up uh, to that last few minutes of the program, try to wrap this up for you. Don't go away. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rizal Live. 105.9 FM and AM 630 WMAL. Welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Tom Rosell. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosell live, as you do every Sunday at high noon on the eastern seaboard, that is, in the mid-Atlantic area. And those of you out west, you know the math. And those of you who are listening to us, you know, either on the computer or I, our podcast and so forth, I thank you very much. And particularly those those of you who are serving our nation in the military of and first responders, we are so grateful to you, particularly coming up this Independence Day in a couple of days, this is last weekend. Uh, some of you are taking this weekend, some of you are taking next weekend. But again, thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to take a call only because of the fact that it's uh, it can be on topic. And Matt, how can I help you? Yeah, Dr. Rizal, I, uh, related to your topic, I suspect that you're familiar with uh, Gundry's book, The Plant Paradox. I wanted to get your review, either pro or con. And the second part of my question is uh, related to sugar, which, of course, is a major component of inflammation. Okay, so uh, if a patient comes into your practice, what treatment protocols do you use to... Uh, so we're talking about a half-hour <laughs> response here. So let me, let me just deal with the plant paradox. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about sugar. Dr. Lamp is going to be on the program with me. We're going to cover it intensely because that's what he's going to be doing in his program. But uh, Stephen Gundry's uh, uh, The Plant Paradox, a very interesting book, and there's... 
he's basically put together a lot of uh, information about what happens uh, when you eat things that are reacting the body. He's making a case that lectins uh, that are found in, in glutens and grains and so forth are found in many other things and that we have to be very, very careful with, you know, with uh, what we eat and what we put in our body. So is he on uh, a good track? The answer is yes and maybe and no. So, yes, in fact, that particularly with grains, I have an axiom that is simply this. Why don't put something in your body, and I'm talking about grains and sugars, that you would give to an animal to fatten it up to take it to slaughter, okay? That's right. number one, because it's going to put on all kinds of fat in the body, and you're going to store it in your organ systems and, and the like. Now, are all grains bad? All grains have can convert into sugar. They have these things called... Uh, uh, lectins in them, but they're not all necessarily bad. They can cause inflammation. They can cause, and that inflammatory reaction can cause weight gain. And then subsequently, like we're talking about today, can cause very serious health problems. Now, he goes on to say, this is the panacea. You go back and you can talk about the uh, the blood typing diet by Cook you know, that was out many, many years ago. There's some relationships there, by the way, between the two. Each individual person, each individual blood type, each genetic type, the body type and so forth, have different levels of digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid and pepsins and things that we have from the pancreas and the gallbladder and, and so forth. And so, for example, go to Cook's uh, approach. He said anybody who has is an O blood type has a, uh, can break down meats, uh, dense meats, uh, much faster. Nobody should eat pork simply because of the fact uh, a pig is the filthiest animal in the world. It has high levels of parasites, and it only uh, detoxifies through its feet, doesn't uh, do it through its skin. And uh, uh, pig meat is just a chromosome off from us as a human being. So does he have part of the answer? Yes. I mean, we're talking about you know something coming out every other week with somebody, you know, if you eat vegetables, uh, he's talking about, you know, making sure that you you take out the seeds and things like that and watching the whole grains. And, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, eating white foods instead of, of uh, you know, like white rice, if I remember the book well enough, and instead of brown rice. Well, there's wild rice as well, which is really good for you. Uh, so you have to be careful. It, I'm Sicilian, as many of you know. I'm first generation from the old country. And my grandmother, when she made sauce... She would take the, she would parboil the tomatoes, she would take the skin off, and then she would sieve the tomatoes to make the marinara sauce. So we didn't have the seeds, we didn't have the skins in it, and that's really a true Italian sauce, by the way, not the stuff that you buy in a jar outside. So the short answer is he has a lot of the answer. It depends on the person, it depends on the digestive levels. Again, uh, Matt... I wish you would have called earlier. I would have spent more time on this. There's a lot of little pieces that you really need to get into to understand what his, uh, why he says what he says. Do I think he's right? A big hunk of it, he's right on the mark. Do I think there's a lot of room for conversation here? Yes, absolutely. Ask that question next week when uh, Dr. Lamb's here. We're coming up to the end, and unfortunately, I wish it was like three hours long, but nevertheless, I love you all. Bye. Are you dental phobic? Do you neglect your dental health because of fear and anxiety? A beautiful smile begins with exceptional dental care, and you can trust in the expertise of Soft Touch Dental Care and Dr. Michael Chung. Soft Touch Dental Care is unlike any dentist office you'll ever experience. Their warm and welcoming environment is designed to soothe fears and anxiety the moment you arrive, and they're especially pleased to pamper their honored guest patients. Dr. Michael Chung is a professional and leading expert in all areas of comprehensive dentistry, including cosmetic, sedation, neuromuscular, TMJ, and implant dentistry. Offering state-of-the-art technology, Dr. Chung can give you the smile of your dreams. Arrange for a complimentary consultation today with Dr. Michael Chung and experience the expertise that makes Dr. Michael Chung so unique. Call 703-319-6990. That's 703-319-6990. Or visit bestinsmile.com. That's bestinsmile.com. 
This is Dr. Tom Rosell. After 38 years of practice and almost a million patient visits, the Rosell Center for Healing knows what works and knows how you can take control of your health and wellness. My team of doctors practice 21st century integrative medicine. Whether you suffer from chronic pain and fatigue, allergies or headaches, we can help. Take charge of your health before it's too late. Make an appointment today. Call 703-698-7117 or visit online at rosellcare.com. This is Dr. Tom Rosell, author of Ageless Health, Health Is, a do-it-yourself program. My book, now also available in audio version, is a step-by-step program of how to take control of your health and wellness without drugs or needless surgery. You have the capacity to change your health and level of well-being. Take control of your health today and order Health Is, a do-it-yourself program. For more information and to order, please visit agelesshealthbook.com. That's agelesshealthbook.com. Breast cancer is a major health risk to all women. It can silently grow uninterrupted for years. The Thermography Centers of Fairfax reminds all women to conduct monthly and annual breast exams. Consider a thermography scan from the Thermography Centers as an adjunct to your routine breast exams. Digital infrared thermal imaging is safe and non-invasive. For more information and to schedule an appointment, call 703-520-7591 or visit thermographycenters.com. Thank you. 